Okay, thanks, Phil. And uh, I appreciate uh, all the work that you and the other agents have done to uh, put this together. Um, it, it certainly saves a lot of travel on my end uh, by being able to address a lot of you at the same time. So I, I'm hoping that maybe meetings like this, um, while they won't replace our face-to-face -face meetings, I think uh, time and again, it, it might be nice even after COVID to have some meetings like this where we can uh, more efficiently talk to a lot of people across the state. So I've, I've really appreciated uh, you doing this and I think it's worked out really well. So let me share my screen here. I see your PowerPoint, Rick, but we're there we go. Now there we go. Yeah, it, it just takes a minute on my end. So, so yeah, as, as Phil said, we're going to talk about flowers tonight. We'll, we'll talk about annual and perennial flowers. Um, and, uh, it, you know, flowers are a part of gardening. Um, we, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about vegetable gardening, but uh, I always like to see people incorporating some flowers into their vegetable garden. Not so much that the flowers are going to rid the garden of any insects and disease. Um, they do help to invite a lot of beneficial uh, insects to the garden, but I think anytime you've got an environment that is a little bit more diverse, uh, it, it's a good thing. And so introducing, you know, flowers in and around the vegetable garden or even fruit plantings uh, is uh, very desirable. So tonight uh, we'll, we'll start off and, and have a, a few boring slides, right, about general comments. We'll talk about, you know, how things grow, fertilization and those sorts of things. And then we'll get into the not so boring slides that talk uh, about specific uh, flowers. We'll first talk about the perennial flowers, those that come back year after year. Uh, and then we'll finish up with annual flowers, uh, those that we have to plant uh, every year, but uh, the ones that really we, re we uh, rely on for a lot of color uh, in our landscapes. And uh, Phil sent these uh, uh, publications out earlier, but we have three publications on this topic, one for annual flowers, and then one uh, each for perennial flowers for sun and for shade. And uh, uh, just like we uh, pointed to last time uh, with the Department of Horticulture website, I put that link down there with a direct link uh, into uh, the flower information for home gardeners. So I hope you have a chance to, to check that out and uh, lots of good information there. So let's start off and talk about uh, adaptation. You know, flowers, like many plants, uh, you know, uh, any given species does not necessarily grow everywhere, right? So we need to think about, you know, is this plant in the right place in terms of sun exposure? You know, if, if it's a full sun plant, then we need to try to get that plant at least six hours, if not eight hours or more of direct sunlight a day, right? If it's a shade plant, then it can take a lot less uh, uh, sun. Uh, soil moisture, most of the things that I'm going to talk about today do best uh, if they uh, have good, uh, even, and abundant soil moisture. You know, uh, very few plants uh, like to live in soupy soil. We'd like to have soils that are well-drained. Um, but a few of these I'll, I'll point out that, you know, might take a little bit more uh, uh, saturated soils or might uh, tolerate dry soils for longer periods of time. And then soil structure, you know, uh, when we're planting these things, it, it always helps to loosen up the soil. You know, in Kentucky, uh, we're blessed or we're cursed by having a lot of clay in our soils. You know, clay does lots of good things for the soil. It, it uh, helps to hold water, it helps to hold nutrients, uh, but it also uh, provides less than ideal drainage and it can also cause the uh, you know, it can uh, uh, contribute to poor, poor soil structure, uh, which usually we see that as compaction, right? So anytime we can work up the soil, and in the case of annual and perennials, incorporate, 
you know, good things into the soil like uh, organic matter and things like that, uh, all the better. And then pH. So uh, again, most of these plants are going to be uh, uh, enjoying a soil that has a slightly acid pH, uh, maybe around pH 6 uh, up to 6.5. Uh, a few things that are more woodland in nature, you know, may not may like it a little bit more acid. Uh, and so we'll, we won't really talk too much about pH. Uh, the ones I'll talk about tonight are pretty much the ones that are uh, suited to uh, that pH 6 to 6.5. And then pest management, you know, so, so luckily in our ornamental plants, uh, we don't usually have a pest uh, uh, issue that warrants uh, a lot of treatment you know so uh, that first thing there adaptation if we've chosen the right plant for the right place right we've got a plant that is uh, planted uh, it's it's suited to the amount of sunlight it's going to get it's it's uh, tolerant of the soil conditions then it's going to grow vigorously and it can usually tolerate or resist most of the plant problems that we do have uh, if we practice sanitation, you know, cleaning up uh, the flower bed, uh, especially in the fall after the perennials have, you know, uh, gone underground and kind of gone to sleep and the annuals are spent, uh, that gets rid of a lot of the pests that we had over the summer. And so they're not there to uh, reinfest things in the, in the next uh, growing season. And then, you know, just observation and scouting. You know, uh, uh, aphids can be a problem on a lot of these uh, these plants, uh, but a lot of times we have natural predators there eating the aphids. So if we see those, you know, it, it's a good thing. We don't have to reach for that uh, uh, bottle of pesticide, be it uh, organic or synthetic pesticides, whatever. And then, you know, on the rare occasion um, where we might need to use a pesticide, we just need to make sure that we're making the right decision, you know. So your county agent can help you with this, uh, but the uh, the down and dirty that I tell people is that you need to look at that pesticide label. That pesticide label needs to say at least two things. It needs to indicate the plant or the group of plants like uh, annual and perennial flowers uh, that you're going to treat. Make sure that, you know, that pesticide is uh, labeled to treat that particular plant and also make sure that that pesticide is going to address whatever problem that you see. Uh, on the plant. So remember that, you know, applying pesticides, we have to follow uh, the pesticide label. It's there for uh, our safety as well as for the good of our environment. So we'll talk also about some of these uh, for uses. Uh, I think especially the perennials, because, you know, perennials are going into our landscapes, hopefully for uh, a long period of time. You know, we don't plant perennials with the thought we're going to dig them up next year like we do annuals. We plant them thinking that they're going to be there for a long time. So we think about, you know, what's the ideal place to put them. So some of them are going to be good for borders, um, you know, or other beds. Uh, I'll try to point out some of that. It'll be in the notes with some of the flowers. Um, some of them may be especially suited to things like rock gardens or woodland gardens or butterfly gardens. You know, we have a big interest these days in attracting pollinators or, or doing things to benefit pollinators. So I'll try to point out some plants that are, are good pollinator plants uh, as well. Some are used for ground covers, right? And then some may not be the prettiest plants to look at from their foliage or their architecture, uh, but they have really nice flowers that can be cut and used in arrangements. You know, so we'll have a few of those as well. So let's talk specifically about perennials here. Um, so perennials, uh, in terms of design, using them in the landscape, you know, obviously uh, for any kind of thing we use in the landscape, we have to consider the height of it, you know, so, and that's going to dictate where we place that plant uh, in a bed or border, you know, and, and, and again, uh, simplicity kind of rules. Uh, you have to think about the tallest things are going to be uh, you know, at the far edge of the border, or they're going to be at the middle uh, of a planting bed, unless you've got a planting bed that's just, you know, visible from one side. Uh, think about color combinations, you know, um, not all colors look well together. You know, we have uh, 
colors that are opposite on uh, what we call the color wheel that kind of gives us some science behind uh, choosing colors. And colors that are opposite have very high contrast, right? And so sometimes we put colors together like a green and red that have high contrast and really draw attention to the landscape. Other times we may put colors that are very close together on the color wheel that blend together. And so they give a softer kind of palette to our landscapes. With perennials especially, we have to think about continuation of bloom, right? So usually, well, well, it, usually annuals are the plants that we depend on to bring color, long lasting color to the landscape. Because in annuals, if we get them started right, keep them growing with, with uh, uh, you know, uh, the right uh, types of maintenance, uh, water, fertilize, they will bloom the entire season, right? The only thing that stops them is that first killing frost in the fall. And some things even go beyond that, right? But with perennials, most perennials don't bloom season long. You know, we can only count on our hands a few of them that do. I'll try to point those out but most perennials will, will only bloom for two or three weeks, right? And, and then they're, they're finished for the year. And so if we're relying on perennials solely for color, we've got to put a lot of things together that are going to overlap for bloom and provide that color, right? It's, it's much easier to get that consistent color from annuals. And then finally, there's a few plants, you know, that I'll, I'll show that uh, we grow for foliage, not really for flowers, right? We're looking for that foliage texture that can also be kind of a breath of uniqueness uh, in our landscape kind of thing. Okay, so um, any questions before I start uh, going into these plants? And I have to admit, I'm going to have to go pretty quick to try to uh, cover as many as I want to. I want to try to cover about 50 or 60 plants uh, tonight. So. Uh, any questions before we go forward? Nope, not right at the moment, but uh, okay. I did forget to remind everybody that as you do get put uh, questions, make sure you get them in the chat box. Okay, very good. So so here we go. And I, I apologize if I go too fast, but you've got the, the, uh, the PowerPoint. You can read the notes uh, and also those, uh, those uh, publications have the plants pretty much arranged as I have them here. There's more plants in those publications than I have time to talk about tonight, but they're generally arranged by a uh, scientific name or Latin name, and that's the way that I've arranged the PowerPoint. So you should be able to find more information on them pretty e easily. So perennials, just a, uh, one more slide about uh, care issues, right? Uh, preparing the soil. So when I look at annuals versus perennials, I think, you know, when I go out to dig the soil and prepare a bed, when I'm preparing it for annuals, I think, well, if my back's hurting a little bit or, you know, I didn't sleep that well last night, I can skimp a little bit on the annuals, right? Because they're only going to be there for a year. I've got another opportunity to do it next year, right? To, to put more uh, elbow grease into uh, developing these beds. But that's not true of perennials, right? Perennials, you're planting them. You hope that they're going to stay in that spot for several years, right? So take some time to prepare the soil. You know, do a soil test. Incorporate the things that you need. If you need to change pH, you know, limestone or sulfur. Um, think about incorporating some organic matter into the soil. Uh, that's a good thing. Second there, pay attention to spacing, right? So if, if you bought uh, 12 hostas uh, for your hosta collection and on the labels of those, it says to plant, you know, to space them two feet apart, then space them two feet apart. You know, don't plant them on six inch centers because come next year, you're going to be digging up half of them to move somewhere else, right? So pay attention to that spa spacing recommendation. Uh, it's important. Uh, when we're planting or transplanting or moving plants around, uh, the best thing to do is to keep plants growing at about the same level they were previously growing. You know, that's our general mantra in horticulture. Plant things the same level it's previously growing with very few exceptions, right? Uh, most perennials uh, need about an inch of water a week. 
And unlike annuals, many perennials can become somewhat drought tolerant once they're established. So it's not uncommon for them to withstand, withstand a couple of weeks without watering, uh, you know, and, and still doing okay. <clears throat> Fertilizing, uh, we put about a, a tenth to a, a two tenths of a pound of actual nitrogen. So, you know, if you're using a 10% fertilizer, that would be one to two pounds of, you know, a 10% nitrogen fertilizer. We do that uh, in split applications, half of it, one application, and another application about uh, six weeks later. That first application usually goes down about the time perennials are starting to regrow uh, in the spring. Uh, as I told, uh, you know, many of you that were on the previous calls in Kentucky, we find that uh, phosphorus and potassium, uh, P and K, are very, very rarely needed uh, in our soil. So unless you've done a soil test, we don't recommend anything but nitrogen uh, to be applied to these. Now, a little bit about propagation, right? So perennials, um, most perennials are named cultivars, right? So when you buy them, you're buying that named cultivar. It is a clone. All of those named cultivars should perform exactly the same, right? So if we try to propagate those by seed, we lose that named cultivar designation. It kind of goes back to whatever the parents were that resulted in that cultivar. So really with perennials, we propagate them by division or separation, right? It's basically the same uh, process. Uh, division means that you're using a knife to cut apart the, the crown of the plant. Separation means you're pulling it apart, right? Uh, generally, uh, spring is the time we do uh, division or separating on summer and fall blooming plants. Fall is the time we do it on spring and early summer blooming plant plants. And that said, many perennials can be lifted any time of the year as long as there's minimal dis disturbance to the root ball. So things like daylilies, you know, you can pretty much dig them up and move them around. Uh, when you want to, as long as you're careful and not disturb those plants that you're movi moving uh, a lot. So here just uh, shows these, uh, you know, division is cutting. So the upper uh, picture here showing a crown of a plant uh, that's being cut uh, because it's a very thick crown. But then you have other plants like hostas that have uh, more recognized growing uh, points or easier to pull apart. And so you pull those apart instead of cutting. It's usually a little bit easier on the plant. So either one of these uh, works uh, real well, just uh, kind of depends on how tight that crown is. Okay, so now we'll get into some examples, right? So the first one here is Japanese anemone. Uh, I, I really like this plant. Uh, it's a late summer and uh, into fall blooming plant. So that's a time when a lot of other things are, are getting kind of tired and, and not really, you know, uh, flowering as well. Uh, it has attractive foliage. Uh, it can get kind of tall and flower, uh, three to four feet, uh, and it will lodge uh, if you're not carefully careful. Lodging means that it will fall over. So a lot of times we plant this close uh, you know, in a border close to like a, a fence or something to protect it a little bit from the wind. Here's a uh, hybrid columbines. Now the columbines that are not hybrid, we can see when we go uh, on walks in the woods. They're very prevalent. I see them especially in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, you know, I see them in the Red River Gorge. Uh, they're not really as uh, showy as this, although we have a red columbine that's native uh, that's pretty showy, but these, these are hybrids. They've been selected to uh, have showier flowers. Now, one say, thing I'll say about columbine, and you can kind of see it in this upper picture. In the spring of the year, uh, we have a pest on columbine that's the columbine leaf miner, right? And so this insect gets in the leaves between the upper and lower epidermis of the leaves, and it just channels around. Right, and so everywhere it goes, it leaves a little uh, uh, dead spot. It's, it's not really dead, it looks more like it's been bleached, right? Just a little white 
white area. And some of these are kind of serpentine and, and things. So this insect uh, is one that we need to learn to tolerate because it, it doesn't really do any long-term damage to the plant. If you get a severe infestation, the plant will defoliate, but it'll pull out, put out more foliage uh, that year. So the reason I think we should just tolerate it is because think about what is necessary to control an insect that is living inside the foliage of a plant, right? If we use a contact uh, insecticide like seven or malathion, it won't do anything to, uh, uh, to harm that insect down inside the plant. We would have to use what's called a systemic insecticide, right? And so systemic insecticides, we usually apply it to the soil as a drench. We might apply it to the foliage, but the entire plant takes up this uh, pesticide, right? And it gets moved into all parts of the plant, including the flower, you know, it can also be secreted in nectar. And so I find that using systemics are not the safest things to use around pollinators, right? So uh, with columbine and knowing that the insect is there at the same time the plant is flowering, then I just stay away from it. I just use, learn to tolerate the insect. Again, it, it usually doesn't have a lot of lasting damage uh, to the the plant. Now, sometimes we use those uh, systemic insecticides on plants specifically when they're not flowering, and that's a much safer time to use those things with regard to pollinators, right? So speaking of pollinators, here's butterfly weed. Uh, it's one of our native Asclepias. Asclepias are milkweeds. Uh, so this one we see uh, usually around fence rows and kind of out of the way places. Uh, very bright uh, flowers there, uh, very attractive, uh, not quite as weedy as some of our other milkweeds, but milkweeds, Asclepias, are known as uh, the food for monarch butterfly caterpillars, right? So monarch butterfly caterpillars feed on nothing else but milkweed. And so this is a great plant to have in your garden if you want to be friends with monarch caterpillars, right? The, 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 uh, the butterflies are attracted to the flowers. They lay their eggs on the plants. Uh, you know, usually you can see some of the, the bright uh, uh, striped caterpillars there as well. So it's a great plant for butterfly gardens. If, if you're interested in uh, this special type of garden called a monarch way station, I believe you have to have at least two or three species of Asclepias in that way station to be, to be certified as a monarch way station. So here's asters. Asters are another great uh, pollinator plant. They bloom generally uh, in fall, uh, late summer and into fall. Uh, we have a lot of asters that are roadside plants. Uh, some of them have now you know, been selected for cultivation. Uh, big problem with asters is powdery mildew. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about powdery mildew on plants because it shows up uh, quite a bit, right? So what I like to do if I know a plant is going to be susceptible to powdery mildew, I want to put it in an area in the landscape where it will get good morning sun because, you know, powdery mildew, like many other fungi, need a layer of moisture uh, on the plant surface in order for the uh, spores to germinate and for the fungus to infect the plant, right? So if you're placing these plants in an area where they get morning sun, then that means any nighttime moisture, be it from dew or overnight rains, uh, will dry off quicker than if you've got those plants, uh, you know, uh, in the morning shade. Here's chrysanthemum. I put chrysanthemum in here as more of a warning uh, than something good to grow, right? So um, we all see chrysanthemums potted up in the fall of the year. We buy them for the color that they bring our landscapes in the fall of the year. Um, and you know, uh, I, like many other people, try to plant those in my landscape and I'm usually very disappointed, right? 
So chrysanthemums don't do extremely well in Kentucky as perennial plants. You know, we have a lot of growers who will grow them as potted plants and sell them for uh, color in the fall. And, and that's a good use for chrysanthemums. But uh, our seasons, especially our winter and spring seasons, are too variable for chrysanthemums to hold their hardiness uh, and to do well. So where we do see success in chrysanthemums is if we can find plants to plant in the spring. They generally establish better with a spring planting than with a fall planting. Unfortunately, where we see chrysanthemums sold the most as is in the fall. And those fall plantings just don't, uh, don't uh, establish nearly as well as a spring planting. And even the spring plantings are not usually really long lived. So here's echinacea. This is a, one of our uh, native plants, a native plant that's been now uh, cultivated and hybridized. We've got lots of different colors of echinacea. It started out as a purple cone flower. Hopefully you can see the bee on the bottom picture. They are uh, very good for pollinators. Uh, they're also very good for songbirds. Uh, finches in particular like to come down and eat the uh, seeds that are produced on their flower head. So it's one of those plants I'm not in a hurry of cleaning it up in the fall. I like to leave the seed heads there for birds to come and, and feast on all winter long. So here's daylilies, right? Daylilies, a, a very attractive uh, plant, a very popular plant. Um, they uh, uh, grow well for us. You know, the, the kind of the top left one is what a lot of us might know as ditch lily. Uh, we see it a lot of times, you know, particularly around old homesteads. Uh, they kind of uh, make their homes in the uh, uh, culverts and ditches uh, around our roadways. These plants are not native. They were introduced by the early settlers. Uh, so we have no native daylilies in Kentucky, even though we see a lot of them uh, in the wild, right? So, um, uh, but they, they, they do well for us. Um, uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, go crazy over daylilies. They have their daylily patches. They sell daylilies to other people, uh, all well and good. Uh, Recently, we've had uh, this phenomenon of reblooming daylilies, right? So the bottom picture there is a cultivar called Stella deora. That's one of the first reblooming daylilies. And everybody got real excited about this because now, wow, I've got these great daylilies. They're going to rebloom. So what this means by reblooming is you have the normal, you know, spectacular bloom. Uh, in early summer, and then a few weeks later, you get a few more blooms, right? It's not nearly as spectacular as that first bloom. So don't be, you know, uh, uh, led astray by that reblooming uh, label. Uh, they do rebloom, but that second bloom is not nearly, you know, as uh, exciting as that first bloom. So here's hookeras, uh, coral bells. Uh, we also have hookeras uh, in our, our, our forest uh, as uh, little plants. The, the foliage looks very similar. Uh, the flowers are nothing to write home about. In fact, um, th this is the coral bell that I, when I was growing up, was in my mother's and grandmother's gardens, right? Had pretty little pink flowers. People used them in arrangements. Um, the foliage was kind of, you know, plain green. Now we have hookeras that have beautiful foliage, right? Variegated, uh, uh, deep colors. Uh, and by the way, uh, generally the variegated and deeper colors don't like as much sun as the plain ones. They will, will do okay in, in a lot of sun. But the more variegated foliage ones don't have the flower appearance of the plain foliage ones, right? So the plant breeders really need to get together and figure that out, but uh, uh, it, it's not happening too quick here. But even though those flowers are not very showy, they are still major pollinator 
attractors. They uh, pollinators really like uh, coral bell flowers. So here's a rose mallow. This is another plant that's actually native here. If you go to some of our uh, around some of our lakes, especially Western Kentucky, uh, you'll see this uh, flowering. The, the wild type looks more like the above uh, picture, uh, but these have huge flowers. Uh, some of these flowers are dinner plate size, right? And they are perennials. They die back to the ground uh, every season. Uh, so this might be something to look into. Now, there is a range of hibiscus. So if you're buying these, you know, from a mail order catalog or even from, you know, your, your local plant source, make sure that you're buying cultivars that are rated for Kentucky's climate. So get them, you know, uh, zone six or lower is what you want to be hardy here. Here's peonies. Uh, peonies, uh, very uh, popular. Um, uh, the peonies, again, I remember from uh, my uh, old landscapes were, were this type. They grew up and they kind of flopped over. Uh, that's okay. You forgave them because you could smell them, you know, uh, several feet away. Really, really uh, fragrant. Uh, and then other forms of peonies as well. Single peonies, tree peonies. So peonies, uh, unfortunately, uh, are susceptible to a lot of soil-borne diseases, uh, different things, and so they may not persist uh, for an extremely long time uh, in your soil. Uh, be sure to get them a very good drainage of soil, maybe put them on raised beds or a berm if you need to. Uh, another uh, thing about peonies, there's a, an urban myth that ants are required for peonies to flower, right? If you go out and look at your peonies when they've got these big buds, inevitably you see ants on the, the plants. And so a lot of people say, well, if the ants weren't there, they wouldn't flower. Well, the ants are just there because there's some nectar-like substances coming out from those buds uh, and they're having a meal. They're not doing anything bad to the plant, nor are they assisting the plant to flower uh, either one. So uh, some flocks, I'm going to just uh, talk about the uh, uh, flock subulata or moss pink. Uh, sometimes I call it creeping flocks. Uh, my guess, these will be coming into flower here in two or three weeks, right? They're uh, pretty early spring flowering. They're usually flowering about the same time as some of our spring bulbs uh, like crocus and daffodils, but they make a spectacular display, uh, you know, on the ground. And they're not bad as a ground cover either. They kind of have this fine textured foliage. Uh, so the bottom picture there, they're, they're a pretty good ground cover. They're very easy uh, to propagate in the spring, just move you know, tufts of the plant around different places. Uh, very easy plant to grow. So here's Rebecca, uh, Black-Eyed Susan. So we have uh, native Black-Eyed Susans as well. I think this particular variety is more of a Midwestern plant, but, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I think of plants that are native to the uh, eastern United States as kind of, you know, what I call native because uh, they pretty much do well here. Now, some people may just, you know, think of only plants, you know, native to Kentucky uh, as what they'll grow, but, uh, but this is kind of, uh, you know, uh, closely native or maybe based on some native uh, uh, species. Um, but uh, these uh, do extremely well. Uh, Goldstrom is a variety that's been around for a while. It was a perennial plant for the, of the year. Uh, it is the cultivar that you see here in these pictures. Uh, it's really good. It, it, uh, some uh, Rebecca's have uh, problems with powdery mildew. Uh, Goldstrom uh, is not, uh, doesn't have nearly the problem that some others do, so. A couple of sedums. The first one here is stone crop. Uh, it's the low growing season sedum. Uh, we have a native sedum in the state, uh, but it is an annual. Uh, uh, it, it's not really cultivated uh, in gardens much. These are all perennial. Uh, they all grow, you know, fairly low. Uh, they all flower. The flowering is, is usually spectacular as you see here. Uh, 
Um, so because they're low growing, a lot of people like to use these in rock gardens uh, or in edging, uh, places like that. And this is the upright sedum, uh, showy sedum. So you may have heard of Autumn Joy is a very common uh, cultivar. I think it's, it's the one on the bottom there, maybe the one in the center as well, although I think the center is a little bit uh, too, uh, too uh, pale for Autumn Joy. Uh, but these are, are really good plants, very hardy, very upright, right? If you use them as uh, cut flowers, but uh, I like to leave them in the landscape. They're great even after, you know, frost has come and uh, kills the plants because the plants stay upright. They kind of bronze in terms of their foliage and flowers. And they look good when they get a little bit of a frost on them or a little bit of snow, you know. Um, uh, if, you, if you think snow looks good, we may not think it looks too good after what we went through this, this season, but uh, generally snow, you know, looks good on plants uh, in the winter, and this is one that can capture it and look pretty well. Okay, so I'll pause here for any questions, then we'll talk about some perennials for shady locations. Hey, Doc, got a couple of questions. Uh, I missed one of them earlier, and I do apologize. What did you mean by plant at the same level? So uh, plant it such that uh, it's not planted any deeper or more shallow than it was previously growing, right? So uh, just just keep uh, keep it uh, the root system and the crown of the plant plant at the same level that it was previously growing. Sounds good. And then. Uh, for beginner gardeners, you mentioned uh, applying an inch of water per week. Any good way to measure that mm. as a rule of thumb? So that that is uh, that's a good question, uh, and and one I get quite often, right? So when we think about this horticulturally, we think that uh, an inch of water generally wets the soil about six or seven inches. So if you've ever been somewhere like the Biltmore or somewhere where there's a public garden and you see a groundskeeper out uh, watering with a hose, they usually have a little, uh, you know, landscape knife or something that they dig into the soil and see how deep that water is going. So it will go, you know, uh, an inch of water usually penetrates the soil five to six inches. Now, another way you can do this is you can take little cans like tuna cans or cat food cans, set them around different places in your garden where you're watering. And then as you're watering, you know, or maybe you've got a sprinkler that's watering, as those cans fill up, you know, assuming that you're watering pretty uniformly, that would be an indication that you've watered about an inch of water, right? And so for young perennials, that inch of water will usually get them through a week. Now, as I said earlier, if uh, once the perennials are established, usually they're a little more drought tolerant and you may be able to just uh, primarily rely on rainwater to water them. Sounds good, sir. That's all I've got at the moment. Okay, well, we will keep going here. So these are our perennials for shady locations, right? So they're gonna be uh, less than uh, six hours of uh, direct sunlight a day, but most of these are still going to want a little bit of sunlight, whether that's, you know, dappled shade uh, or at the edge uh, of, you know, a tree's uh, canopy line or something. Uh, there's very few plants that we'll talk about that will tolerate really, really deep shade. So uh, we, we may come across some. If we do, I'll, I'll try to point that out. So the first one here is a steel bee. Uh, a steel bee is a really nice uh, plant. It's got these kind of wispy blooms uh, in uh, late spring and into summer. Uh, you see they're, they're kind of pastel uh, in uh, colors, kind of the pink and, and uh, maroon range. So they're really nice. Uh, a steel bee needs two things, shade and moisture. Uh, they don't tolerate uh, dry soils at all. So uh, if you have a steel bee, you have to have them in an area 
you know, that has plenty of moisture or be willing to water uh, when uh, the dry times come. Here's a plumbago uh, or lead wart. wart. Uh, plumbago, it, it's really kind of a woody plant, but I include it with the perennials because uh, we uh, manage it by cutting it back to the ground uh, every year. It, it makes it uh, more vigorous and that blooms better in the spring to do that. So that's the reason we do it. Uh, interesting thing about this plant is the leaves are, uh, they feel like sandpaper, right? So uh, probably something to keep uh, insects from foraging on them or maybe other things from foraging on them, but uh, uh, but that's uh, kind of interesting about these, but uh, blue flowers in spring and then again in fall. Here's Lily of the Valley. So uh, Lily of the Valley is, uh, you know, is, is a pretty plant. Uh, it's kind of a, a late spring plant. Um, if you've uh, ever grown Lily of the Valley, you know that it can be a very difficult plant to control it spreads. So it, it generally stays away from the sun. Um, that will, you know, dissuade it. Uh, a good lawnmower will dissuade it. But if you have flower beds where it is planted, it will probably expand to all areas of those flower beds, you know, unless they are uh, got a lot of sun. So just be aware of that uh, when you're planting it. Here's bleeding heart. Um, we have some uh, native bleeding hearts, um, I, uh, but uh, these are, are uh, uh, not native. I'm not sure where they're from, but uh, something interesting about bleeding hearts, you can, you can guess where they get their name by the, the shape of their flower. Bleeding hearts have summer dormancy, right? So when it gets really hot and dry, the plant may just decide it's it's time to to rest for a while, right? And so don't be alarmed uh, if this plant starts to die back in midsummer, especially if you've got heat and drought, right? If you got a lot of moisture, it, it may keep going all summer long, but it's not going to hurt it uh, to retreat uh, in the summer. Here's a hellebores, so Linton rose. Uh, these are our very early flowering plants. They, some of these actually flower before some of our, our, our bulbs do, right? So it's called Linton Rose because it typically flowers during the season of Lent, right? Which what, is what we're in now, the, the six weeks before Easter. So they're uh, interesting flowers because they're always nodding. Right there, uh, there, there's some uh, new cultivars that they bred that have more erect flowers, uh, but typically hellebores have nodding flowers, and the way to appreciate the flowers is to clip them off and float them in a bud vase or something. Uh, but uh, they're uh, very hardy for us, uh, maybe a bit too hardy. They do self seed quite a bit, but I don't ever see them on invasive species lists, so they must be behaving themselves pretty well and not really getting out of the cultivated environment. So here's hostas. Uh, hostas is very popular uh, with a lot of people. Now there are certain hosta cultivars that I would say would do well in full shade. Um, there are other cu uh, cultivars that are uh, more recent uh, releases that take more and more sun. So hostas are quite variable uh, in terms of the light requirements for them. And they're a plant, uh, I wouldn't say we grow them only for their foliage because their flowers look uh, nice as well. Their flowers also attract pollinators, uh, hummingbirds, bumblebees, things like that. Uh, but typically we think of hostas, we think of the, uh, you know, variegated foliage and, and colored foliage that they have. Uh, and that's usually the way uh, uh, we use them. Okay, so any questions before we go to annual flowers? I do got one. Any suggestions for sedum that is not blooming? Sedum that is not blooming. I can't think of any right away. Just, just did you grow for foliage? 
I, I don't know of any right away. Now, um, some sedum relatives, maybe like uh, the Echeverias, like hen and chicks, uh, they tend not to bloom too much. I think they still bloom occasionally, but mostly they're a vegetative, so. But no, I don't know much about uh, non-blooming sedums. Well, I, I think the question was, Doctor, it, why is it not blooming? Oh, why it's not blooming. I would say it's probably, generally, the first thing I ask when people say something's not blooming is I say, is it getting enough sun, right? So sedums are a plant that need, need a lot of sun to bloom, I think. The second uh, discussion I would have is, are you fertilizing it? And if you are, you may be using too much nitrogen because too much nitrogen can cause plants to grow more vegetatively and you know not produce as many flowers. So those are the two things I would look at uh, in terms of seed of not blooming. Okay. Uh, is it okay to plant annuals or perennial flowers inside the drip line of a shade tree? So I think as uh, inside the drip line, I would think it's going to be, you know, shady and get more shady as you get toward um, the, the trunk. So that's the only thing that I would think about. Now, of course, um, when you're under a tree, you're also going to be competing with the tree's roots for nutrients and water. Uh, so you might have to watch that a little bit more, uh, give those uh, perennials a, a drink a little more often that are under a tree, especially, you know, like a vigorous maple or something that would be uh, sucking up a lot of water. And just one little comment that the deer tend to eat the flower bud, flower buds off of an upright sedum too. So uh, we okay. can address okay. that one next week in the wildlife control that's good. <laughs> okay, so we're ready to go? Yes, sir. Good on my end. Okay, annual flowers then is our last group, but a, a fairly long group, right? So talk a little bit specifically about uh, annual flowers. Uh, annuals are, uh, we usually propagate them by seed, but now more and more uh, seed companies are doing some things genetically uh, that are a little bit different, right? So they're, they're not only crossing plants within a species, like crossing, you know, our garden zinnias with garden zinnias. They're also crossing plants between the species, like garden zinnias with uh, uh, narrow leaf zinnias, because narrow leaf zinnias have powdery mildew resistance, right? and garden zinnias don't, so they wanna do that. So uh, now zinnia is, is not the best example here because usually when you make those crosses, you get uh, at least the first generation is, is fertile so you can propagate by seed. But uh, in a lot of things like uh, impatience, for example, uh, we have a disease in, patient, in impatience called impatience downy mildew uh, that's wreaked havoc uh, with a lot of our impatience. So our garden impatients are susceptible, but New Guinea impatients are immune. So people are crossing those two. Well, when you cross those two, you don't get a fertile offspring, right? You get something that's desirable. It looks good. It looks like an impatient. Uh, it's resistant to downy mildew, but it doesn't produce any seed. So what they have to do with that is propagate it by cuttings, right? So. So more and more, we're seeing some uh, cutting propagation on the market for annual flowers. And a lot of times you can sell, tell which is which by the price tag, because it's much more expensive to propagate by cutting than it is by seed. So you may be paying a premium for some of those plants, but it's the only way to get some of the plants that are the newest and best uh, cultivars, right? So annual plants uh, are kind of like vegetables, right? Most of the things that we'll talk about are warm season plants. They grow from, you know, the latest frost in the spring all the way up to the first frost in the fall, or maybe a little bit on either side, right? right? So those are warm season annuals. But we also have a few cool season annuals uh, that I'll point out as well. 
So soil preparation, I talked about that when we talked about perennials, you know, it's important, but you know, maybe uh, if you don't get, you know, uh, a lot of attention to it this year, you can put more attention to it next year, right? Now, fertilization is a little bit different um, with annuals than perennials. So now here, I, I've got information here that I haven't updated, right? It says one to two pounds of a complete fertilizer at planting. Let's, let's make that one to two pounds of a nitrogen fertilizer at planting. And then a half to one pound every six weeks thereafter. And that's, both of those recommendations are for 100 square feet. Now, if you're doing something like uh, miracle Grow or something like that, you just, you know, uh, regularly in your irrigation water, uh, do that. So the reason for this, you know, perennials, we only fertilize in the early part of the season because we want them to slow down and go to sleep when it's time to go to sleep, right, for the fall and become winter hardy. With annuals, we don't care. We really want them to be growing, 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 growing all season long because they're going to make new flowers, right? So one warning is if you've got annuals and perennials planted together, I would just stick to the perennial fertilization. Just, you know, I, I wouldn't apply any more fertilizer to that mixed bed after about, oh, uh, late June, early July. Give the perennials plenty of time to slow down growth and get ready for dormancy uh, in the fall. So transplanting about the same depth as previously growing. So we covered that already. Water, about an inch of water a week. Now, annuals usually don't become as drought hardy as uh, perennials do. I'll, I'll talk about a few that do, but uh, pretty much if it hasn't rained in the last, you know, uh, five to seven days, uh, a, a good rain, then you may need to water your annuals, right? And then with annuals, we also have this phenomenon called deadheading, right? That is removing spent flowers uh, so that it encourages the plants to regrow. Now, another thing about some of these modern cultivars is when they're sterile, you don't have to deadhead because the plant isn't putting that energy toward those seeds, right? So uh, certain, and, and some of these are also just so vigorous, like wave petunias, they're not sterile, but they're just so vigorous that you don't have to deadhead them uh, either. So I'll try to point out some, and it's in the notes, uh, that we need to worry about deadheading with. Okay, so first one here is uh, ageratum. So uh, ageratum is one that uh, really uh, benefits from deadheading. Uh, and so a, a plant like this, you know, uh, you can deadhead it with a string trimmer if you're if you're careful, right? So all of these flowers are pretty much in sync. They're all going to fade at the same time. So you can either go through with scissors and cut them off, or you can go through, you know, with something else and 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 do some mass deadheading. That's okay. So once you do the deadheading, make sure they're well watered. Maybe give them. Uh, a little bit of uh, fertilizer, you know, to get them started again. And then, you know, they're going to produce uh, more flowers uh, later in the season. Here's snapdragons. So I, I wish snapdragons did better for us in Kentucky. Uh, if you've ever uh, traveled to like the Pacific Northwest uh, in the summer, you see spectacular displays of snapdragons, huge plants, huge flowers because they really need the cool weather. So here, uh, you know, they, they do okay in the spring. Uh, they will do okay if planted in the fall, uh, late summer into the fall is probably the best time to plant them. Uh, but uh, they just don't uh, like our summers uh, very much. They, they'll, they'll grow a little bit and flower a little bit, but you don't see uh, the spectacular flowers like you would if it was cooler. So here's a begonia, which is a fibrous or wax begonia. It's a, a very common uh, bedding plant. Uh, impatience uh, used to be our number one bedding plant. Uh, my guess now is that it's begonias or maybe petunias that have replaced them uh, since we have the, the problem with impatience uh, downy mildew. 
But begonias are good. They'll tolerate some shade. They do okay in sun as well, especially uh, if they're well watered. And they have kind of a range of foliage color from green to bronze to uh, edged in bronze. And then flowers are generally uh, whites, reds, and pinks. So, so here's another, or here's our first, uh, or another cool season annual. We talked about a snapdragon. This is uh, cabbage and kale, right? So uh, the cabbage are the, the ones here on the bottom that are more green. The kales are the ones that are more uh, roughly, right? So these we usually think of as fall plants, uh, plant them in late summer. They do well in the fall and they will really, unless we get an extremely cold early snap, they'll really stick around till about the end of the year. Uh, certainly they'll be there till Thanksgiving and then maybe even till Christmas, you know, if you have mild weather. Um, they do get some of the same pests that we have with cabbage in the garden. Uh, in the growing season, they'll have cabbage loopers, which are just little uh, caterpillars. Uh, and then they really attract aphids. I'm not sure that the aphids are feeding on them so much or that they just give the aphids a great place to overwinter. I just know when, when I have these in the landscape and I pull them up in the fall, there's tons of aphids uh, under there. So maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you're kind of trapping aphids and you're getting rid of aphids when you get rid of this plant, uh, when it's kind of uh, 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 spent its time uh, in the landscape. Here's ornamental peppers. Uh, these are uh, good in the landscape as long as you're patient, right? So uh, a lot of these, you have to wait until late summer and early fall for them to really color up uh, to be spectacular. Now, there are some that uh, have uh, purple fruit that will have purple fruit from the beginning. Uh, some that have white fruit, have white fruit from the beginning. But most of these that are yellows, reds, and oranges uh, just color up uh, later in the season. So you have to be uh, patient. And uh, be careful if you want to try to eat these. They're, they're certainly not uh, dangerous uh, to you. I, I, what I tell people is I wouldn't eat them right out of, you know, getting them from the nursery because you don't know what uh, might have been used uh, in the production of the plants. But certainly, you know, ha have you had them in the landscape for a while? Um, they're not going to be toxic, but some of them are extremely hot. So just be careful. Uh, about using them uh, for culinary purposes. So here is uh, vinca or periwinkle. So this, uh, the thing I'll say about this plant is it, it's, it's a great plant for us. It should be one of the last annual plants that you plant in the spring season because it does not tolerate cool soils. Uh, it needs warm soils. Without warm soils, the foliage is yellow. The plants are studded. They're more prone to diseases. So I would, you know, most of these plants that we're talking about that are summer annuals, here in central Kentucky, we talk about Derby Day as, as kind of the, the day. And, you know, that can be kind of early sometimes. Um, I, I think about, you know, uh, our date for uh, a last frost, our safe date is usually about uh, May 15th, I think that, you know, gets a little bit later as you go into Eastern Kentucky, it may be a little bit earlier in Western Kentucky. But with this plant, I would say I would wait till the end of May or 1st of June, I would give the soil plenty of time to warm up. Before I plant this plant, I think it's going to make it much more uh, successful for you to do so. Here's a coxcomb. So coxcomb has uh, uh, three different uh, foliage types, they have the the comb type, which is the cristata, they have uh, plumosas, and uh, what we're not showing here are spicatas with smaller flowers but longer uh, flowers. <clears throat> so these are, are really a good drought tolerant plants. They take the heat really well. Uh, a lot of them self seed in the garden, meaning that where you planted them this year, if you look closely next uh, spring and don't uh, disturb the soil too much, you may see some new plants coming up. Right, um, and a lot of these are also very pollinator friendly, uh, attract pollinators. 
So here's a Cleome. Cleome is a really old plant. Uh, I think, you know, if we went to our great grandmother's gardens uh, and, and older, we would see a Cleome being grown. And um, the, the old time Cleomes were kind of like the picture up at the top. Uh, and the plants became very uh, long and the, the stems kind of meandered, which is, is kind of interesting, kind of, you know, whimsical. But now we're getting uh, more compact Cleomes, like the bottom ones, uh, that are a little bit easier to manage in the landscape. So Cleomes are another plant that can often uh, self-seed and be a little bit uh, weedy, kind of invasive uh, for some. So here's coleus. Uh, coleus is an annual that we grow uh, mostly for foliage, right? So usually when it starts to flower, we uh, uh, will uh, pinch the flowers back because they're not spectacular at all. Uh, so coleus um, uh, traditionally has been a shade plant. Uh, the plants you see on the bottom there uh, would be a sun coleus. A lot of these uh, more yellow and red and bronze type uh, leafed coleus uh, are, uh, are now released and they're released as sun coleus that will grow in full sun. That's kind of nice. They're great foliage plants to kind of break up the, the garden and uh, give you different texture. Here's a cosmos. Cosmos is uh, in the daisy family. So it will recede uh, as well a little bit. Um, so it says 12 to 24 inches tall. You can get some that are, are much taller than this. Uh, they do, uh, uh, deadheading can be beneficial as well, cutting back those spent blooms. But be careful because those seed heads will also attract, uh, you know, songbirds, finches. Uh, and they're uh, pretty attractive to pollinators as well. Here's a Mexican heather. Um, so this is a plant, uh, I, I like it. I think on the bottom, you can see the architecture of the plant. It produces kind of a herringbone pattern of uh, side branches, uh, which is interesting. So if you're using it as kind of a specimen plant here or as kind of a plant that's an edging plant that might spill over onto a walkway, uh, you would see that uh, as well. Here's globe amaranth. Uh, this is probably one of the toughest plants, uh, annuals that I'll talk about. Extremely drought tolerant, uh, extremely heat tolerant. Uh, so it has a, a wide range of heights. Uh, it's used a lot as a cut flower. You know, if you're using it as a cut flower, I would say, you know, use the taller varieties. Excuse me. Kind of getting the hiccups there. Uh, sunflowers. Um, you know, I, I just got uh, an email from the National Gardening Bureau that said this is the year of the sunflower, right? So uh, uh, I guess they're wanting to sell a lot of sunflower seeds this year, and then that's okay, right? So sunflowers are great plants. They're great pollinator plants. Uh, bees, butterflies love them. And then you leave those seed heads, uh, you know, uh, on for the, the fall and you might get uh, uh, any, you know, birds, many different types of birds, maybe even raccoons and opossums trying to, to get those seeds. They're, they're so packed with uh, oils and nutrients. So powdery mildew, biggest problem with sunflowers. You know, uh, my kind of paradigm of sunflowers is this bottom thing, right? One big plant, one big flower. And if we borrow the lingo we use for tomatoes, we would say that's a determinate sunflower. That means it produces one flower up at the top of the plant and that's what it does, right? Might produce a few side branches, but not many. So the big rage now are to have these indeterminate sunflowers that produce lots of smaller flowers, right? But by smaller, we're still talking, you know, four to five inches across. So they're still going to be uh, spectacular flowers. They, uh, most of them produce seeds. There are some that are sterile. So, you know, if you're wanting seeds, uh, uh, stay away from those. 
Uh, but sunflowers, I think, are a great addition to, to many gardens. Okay, so here's our, our impatience. This is impatience walleriana, which is uh, our kind of garden impatience. So they're very attractive. Uh, impatience will grow in deep shade. They won't flower as much in deep shade. They really like, probably if they had their, their druthers, they would rather be in kind of that edge of the canopy drip line, right? Where they're getting a little bit of protection from the midday sun, but other than that, they're gonna get quite a bit of sun, right? Been very popular as bedding plants, uh, but in the last several years, we've got this disease called uh, impatience downy mildew. And that the bottom picture is what impatience look like. They defoliate, right? So they're very unattractive. And so now there are, you know, starting to be hybrids made. And uh, some of the hybrids are starting now to look just like these impatients. But again, most of them are sterile. And uh, if you want this disease resistance, you're going to have to be willing, you know, to pay for uh, these uh, new cultivars. Otherwise, you know, try to rotate your impatience, you know, into new soil. Uh, my understanding is once you get, uh, the downy mildew, it, it's pretty much there, right? So, and you know, fungi are so hard to deal with. You know, you think, well, is there something I can spray on this, right? Um, so if we think about our tree fruits for a minute, right? So tree fruits like apples are very susceptible to many types of fungal diseases. So the way we protect apples from fungi is we start spraying them just as they're starting to leaf out. And every 10 to 14 days for the next two or three months, we're applying a fungicide to keep the spores on the leaves from germinating, right? Once the fungus goes into the plant, it's really difficult to uh, eradicate. So if we wanted to do that with impatience, we'd have to do the same thing, right? We have to give, uh, we have it called a cover spray. We're keeping the foliage constantly covered with insecticides, with fungicides. And I don't know about you, but that's not really something I want to do around my landscape, right? Now, if I was thinking about uh, picking several bushels of fresh fruit, I might be willing to do that, right? But not right around my doorstep. So here's geraniums. Uh, geraniums, uh, we grow them as potted plants, uh, probably more so than the landscape. And that's probably a good thing because geraniums are very susceptible to some soil-borne diseases. They need really well-drained soils, usually in containers, they have well-drained soils. Plus, you know, those diseases build up if we grow geraniums in the same site year after year. So if you're growing them in containers, I would say definitely change the soil of the container that you're growing them in you know, each year to get fresh soil. I would even wash out the pots uh, because they are very susceptible to some soil-borne diseases. Okay, petunias, uh, again, very popular. Uh, what I'm showing here are uh, wave-type petunias, which uh, have uh, lots of flowers. Um, and uh, they're, they're very, very vigorous. A, a lot of our old time petunias needed to be deadheaded. Uh, most of the modern cultivars do not. They're very, very vigorous or they're sterile, right? So uh, lots of uh, petunias on the market, very good in hanging baskets, in beds. You know, the key is keep them well fertilized, keep them well watered, and they'll really perform uh, for you the season long. So uh, annual salvia mealy cup sage. Uh, this is the first salvia uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, I like to call it blue salvia, but it does have white varieties and, and kind of uh, lavender varieties. Um, but uh, of the two salvias I'm gonna talk about, the other one is scarlet sage. I think this is the more hardy of the two. Uh, it stands up better to pest. Um, it, it just does really well uh, in our environments. Now, this is the other one. This is scarlet sage. You say, wow, you know, it's, it's a whole lot showier than the mealy cup sage. But uh, 
It also tends to fade fairly quickly, that especially in, uh, you know, in, in the full sun. If you got them in partial shade, they'll, they'll last a little bit longer. Uh, they can be very susceptible to powdery mildew. Uh, so I think in terms of, of just sheer summer hardiness, uh, the previous uh, salvia, the Farinaceae or the uh, Millicup sage is better than salvia splendens, scarlet sage. Okay, marigolds. Okay, so marigolds, uh, a plant that people either love or they don't. Uh, if you've smelled of them, you know that uh, they do have not really a fragrance as much as an odor, right? Um, it, it doesn't stop things from eating them. Uh, you know, we think of something that smells that bad, it must be good to put in the garden because it's going to keep all the bugs away, right? But look at the, the bottom left picture. I don't know if you can see that, but those are Japanese beetles just having a feeding frenzy on this marigold, right? Um, so, you know, as I said with the, with the vegetables, you know, I think it's always good to put flowers in your vegetable garden because it invites so many different insects, you know, most of which are beneficial to your garden, you know, and that's a good thing. But uh, we, we just haven't been able to demonstrate using the scientific method that marigolds really uh, dissuade insects from the garden. Now, we do know that if they're used as a cover crop, uh, they can, uh, their roots can uh, repel nematodes, which are little tiny worms in the soil. Uh, but we don't uh, really realize that they do much in the vegetable garden, you know, directly to, uh, to dissuade insects. Okay, verbena. Uh, verbena is uh, another one that uh, can be very drought tolerant. Now, some of these plants I'm talking about drought tolerance, they don't necessarily look great, you know, after two or three weeks of drought. Uh, but they survive. And so that's good because when the rains do finally come, they usually start growing again, start flowering again. And, you know, so from an environmental perspective, that's kind of nice that you didn't have to pamper these plants along, you know, uh, in order for them just to survive uh, for the drought. Uh, but verbenas are, are kind of like annual ground covers. They're low growing. Um, they're, they're really nice plants. In that regard, here's uh, pansies. So pansies, uh, cool season annuals. I think one of the holy grails in uh, landscape horticulture is to breed a pansy that will make it through the summer, right? So uh, as I said uh, in one of the previous talks, I've been involved with All America Selections and we get new varieties of pansies to trial. And uh, so far we've had pansies that'll make it up to about June right, but, but not any further. So uh, they will decline as the uh, uh, hot weather hits. Uh, one thing about pansies that we always uh, promote is that it's much better to start them in the fall of the year, to plant your pansies in the fall of the year. They become established and the bloom is uh, greater the following spring than if you waited until early spring to start your pansies. So, you know, plant them in the fall, uh, give them a light mulch or something to get them through the winter. And then, and they'll, they'll flower a little bit in the winter as well, if you get little warm periods. And then the flower uh, performance will be much better uh, in the spring. Okay, zinnias. I think zinnias is, are my last plant here. So, and I, I'm talking about zinnia hybrids, right? Because if we look down to the bottom, this is not a zinnia hybrid, right? So if you wondered what powdery mildew looks like on a plant, this is it, okay? So the very young uh, flowers are not affected very much, but the leaves, you know, get this uh, powdery substance on their surface. Uh, the flowers will eventually succumb as well. And so it just makes a plant, you know, not very attractive. So we still grow, these garden zinnias, but they're, they're usually in the vegetable garden, not in the landscape, right? Because we're growing them just for those cut flowers because uh, they're not very pretty in the landscape. But as I said earlier, there's been some hybridization. So uh, 
This is a, a little zinnia called zinnia linearis, has little narrow leaves, right? So, but you see it has a whole different growth habit than this. This has long stems, good for cutting. This is, excuse me, short and stocky. So when you cross this with this, you get things like this, right? Very, very attractive. Uh, they're not cut flowers because they don't have long stems, but they make great landscape plants, right? We use them in beddings, uh, as bedding plants, as container plants. Uh, they generally cost a little more. Some of them are sterile. Some of them, you know, are more difficult to propagate. Uh, another thing is when you buy these, they usually don't look very good in the pack because they like to grow as a bush, right? They like to grow spread out. So when uh, growers are growing them in the greenhouse in these little six packs, uh, they're kind of crowded together. They don't like that. So they may not look all that great. They might not be flowering that great in the pack, but it's well worth it to try some of these uh, in the landscape. So two, there's two, there's, there's several, but there's two that, that I'm very familiar with. One is called the profusion zinnias. Uh, they generally are solid color zinnias in all different colors. And the other one that I'm familiar with is called the Zahara zinnias. So the, the middle picture here are Zahara. Some of them have uh, multicolored uh, flowers. So they're kind of attractive as well. So I invite you to try some of these uh, hybrid zinnias. So I think that brings me to the end uh, and uh, I will entertain any questions. Okay. Is there a salvia that is hardy in Kentucky? Oh yeah, we have lots. So I didn't talk about uh, perennial salvias, but but there are uh, perennial salvias. There's uh, one called uh, black and blue that's uh, really pretty that has uh, uh, the, that color of uh, flowers. Uh, and, and there's any number of them. So one thing, uh, if you see salvia as the name of a plant, it is almost always going to be a pollinator plant. It, pollinators love salvias. So, yeah. I think there will be some in the uh, in the Perennials for Sun publication. Good deal. All right. Does Mexican heather do well in eastern Kentucky and over winter? Uh, it doesn't over winter. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't do well. Uh, it, it it does really well for us here. Um, yeah, I, I would think it would do well. It, it needs sun. Okay, and I'm gonna kind of put you on the spot with this one. Roses weren't mentioned in the in the perennial group. Are these considered more of a flowering shrub than a flower? Uh, I do. Uh, I don't usually talk about them with with perennials. Uh, we have a, a whole publication devoted to roses, uh, so you can find that on the the Hort website, or I'm sure your county agent can uh, can get you a copy of that. Yes, yes, we can definitely do that. And I will send it out in an email uh, following up for this meeting. Uh, could you please spell the type of Xenia you were just talking about? So the, the first one is profusion, just like it's spelled. Uh, P-R-O-F-U-S. Uh, the two S's are one, I don't know, profusion. <laughs> Not a very good speller. Uh, it's just like the word profusion. The other one is Zahara, Z-A-H-A-R-A, -A -A, Zahara. Okay. Next Usually question. if you get that close to it on a Google search, it'll show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love the Googles. Uh, is there a way to treat powdery mildew? So I, I, I talked about that a little bit. Um, so the problem is it's a long-term issue, right? So I gave the example of uh, apples and using fungicide uh, to treat apple diseases, and we have to spray them every seven to 14 days throughout the whole season, right? So that's what we would have to do with powdery mildew. Once 
once you see powdery mildew on your plant, it's too late. There's so uh, uh, you have to prevent it rather than cure it. So. Okay, uh, the Rose publication. Uh, there's there's a link in the chat. Uh, let's see here. You didn't mention anything about tulips or daffodils. Could you quickly uh, speak on them? Yeah, so I I uh, I had those in to begin with, and then I took them out just because I was afraid we wouldn't have the time to talk about them. So daffodils are great, you know. So uh, plant them in the fall. Uh, plant them, you know, five to six inches deep, or or what it says on the label. You know, some of them may be smaller. Uh, some larger uh, daffodils generally if you have them in a space where they will get uh, good uh, good sun you know and and even if you have them around shade trees it's not bad because it's going to be a while you know after they come up before the shade trees uh, develop their their foliage so uh, but they need good sun you need to keep the foliage you know not just cut back the foliage when the the flowers are dead. Leave the foliage on until it starts to uh, yellow up, uh, and and they'll be great. So tulips, tulips in Kentucky, uh, reliable shows of tulips are primarily as annuals. So you plant the bulbs in the fall; they bloom spectacularly the next spring, and then after that, you have uh, kind of an inconsistent blooming. Uh, the reason for that is our winters are not consistently cold enough for tulips. Now, having said that, you might have a particular, you know, area in your landscape that maybe it's a low spot and it attract, you know, it, it has uh, late spring frost, early fall frost, maybe it's a colder spot, maybe it'd be great for tulips. But what we find is that tulips just don't perform uh, well here that you get that great first show because the the bulbs are pre-chilled and then you don't get a uh, you don't get the the good repeat blooming in future years and and there's no real way to say dig the bulbs up and put them in the refrigerator and then plant them again that that doesn't work much either sounds great that's all the questions i've got right now um, again, don't forget about next week. Uh, we were going to be talking about wildlife control. Um, Doc, are you going to be joining us back on in case some other questions pop up for next week? Uh, I think I can, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, if no more questions, I'll kind of hang on here for a few more minutes. Uh, I will see you all next week. Everybody take care and uh, we'll see you then. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.